Hi, and welcome to RCF. Easter can be all about surprises, like finding Easter eggs. So today is going to be a little bit different. Throughout the service, people will be sharing things that might have been a little bit unexpected. And some will share things that might have been surprising or might surprise us. So sit back, grab some chocolate, and let's celebrate Easter. I came into work today to complete some things and there it was. I'm sure most adults can guess what's in this parcel. Might be a bit back to front now. It says, it's definitely for me because my name's on the back side of this label. And it says on the front, thank you teacher. And then I thought, well am I really a teacher? Well, I suppose I am in some ways. But the greatest teacher that we all have is Jesus himself. Can you all see that? Isn't that great? That's my surprise. The Garden, the Curtain and the Cross Written by Carl, Carl Lafferton Illustrated by Catalina Etcheverry A very long time ago, right here in this world, there was a garden. In the garden, everything was wonderful. The world was full of laughing and playing and smiling and fun. There was nothing bad ever. There was no one sad ever. And the best of all... God was there. Hello Adam. Hello Eve. He had made it all. He was in charge of it all. He loved it all. People could see God and speak to God and just enjoy being with God. Eve, God's here. He wants to walk with us again. How cool is that? Yay! And it's going to be even more amazing than yesterday. It was wonderful to live with God, but then one day. The people did a terrible thing. They decided they didn't want to do what God said. They decided they wanted a world without God in charge. God calls this sin. Sin spoils things, so sin has no place in God's wonderful garden. God said to the people, you can't live in my garden anymore, and he sent them outside. To show people they had to stay outside, God put some warrior angels in front of the garden. The angel was like a big keep out sign. Now things were bad and people were sometimes sad. But people still kept sinning because they didn't want God to be in charge. So no one could come into God's wonderful place. God said, because of your sin, you can't come in. God wanted people to remember. It is wonderful to live with him, but because of your sin, you can't come in. So he told the people to build a special building called his temple, where he would live. In the middle of the temple was the most wonderful place in the world. The place where God was, with nothing bad and nothing sad. It was very exciting. But then God told the people to put a big curtain around this wonderful place. The curtain had pictures of warrior angels on it. It was a big keep outside. For hundreds of years, the temple curtain reminded people that God said, It is wonderful to live with him, but because of sin, you can't come in.
babies became grown-ups and had babies and those babies became grown-ups and had babies and those babies became grown-ups and had babies hundreds of summers and winters passed by and the keep out curtain stayed in the temple but then one day God's son came to live in this world as a person. He was called Jesus. God did what God said. Jesus never sinned. And Jesus visited the temple where the keep out curtain hung. Jesus knew that things were sometimes bad and sometimes sad. Jesus said that God has sent him to open the way back to God's wonderful place where he, there would be nothing bad and no one sad. But... People still didn't want to let God be in charge, so they decided to put Jesus on a cross to die. It was the most bad thing that's ever happened. It was the most sad day of all time. But Jesus had a plan. He had always planned to die on the cross. What a strange plan! Why would God's son plan to die? On the cross, Jesus took all our sin, all the bad things we do, all the sad things they cause. Jesus took them all from us. When he did, something amazing, astonishing, astounding happened. The curtain, the curtain tore. God had ripped up the keep out sign. God's wonderful place is open again because Jesus died, we can go in. After Jesus died, his friends put him in a tomb. They were very sad. For two days, nothing happened. Then the next morning, Jesus' friends went to see his body in the tomb and it wasn't there. A little later on, Jesus' friends were all together and suddenly Jesus was there, alive. Suddenly his friends weren't sad, now they were so, so happy. God had brought Jesus back to life so that he could live in God's wonderful place forever. And Jesus had sent everyone an invitation to come and live with him there too. He tells us, God says it's wonderful to live with him, but because of your sin, you can't come in. But I died on the cross to take your sin, so all my friends can now come in. We can live with God forever. There will be nothing bad and no one sad. Come on, friends. We will see God and speak to God. Just enjoy being with God. Just study as he planned. And it will be wonderful to live with him. And it's all because of Jesus. We all say every day, thank you, Jesus. You're amazing. And you can start saying that today.
I wrote this in 1986. As a girl, I went to grammar school. A lad called Norm was there. I didn't know him very well, nor really did I care, until when I was 17, purely just by chance, a group of boys, including Norm, decided to learn to dance. The boys were short of partners. There were no girls about. So Liz and I, we gave a hand. Then Norman asked me out. He took me to the pictures. Oh, how oh, it did rain. And when at last he took me home, he asked me out again. The friendship slowly blossomed, in love, so you could say. And for our holes we went to Spain. And while we were away, each night I thought that he'd propose. I really loved that man. He was so dark and handsome, especially with a tan. But just as soon as we got back, he asked me to get wed. Oh, how I dreamt of that young man as I lay in my bed. At Easter, we got married. What happy times we had. We said, we'd like a baby, perhaps a little lad. But we had our lovely Helen, and then Kerry came along, followed quickly by young Stuart. What a happy little throng. And now we're blessed to know the Lord. How good he's been to me. He's given me my Norman and my children, one, two, three. Right, what I'd like to do today is just tell you a little story. Once upon a time, there were these two real close friends, he said. It was a strange, strange mix, because one of them, he was a chicken. And the other one, his best mate, he was a hedgehog. Anyway, one day, hedgehog turned to chicken and he says, Chicken, he says, I know we've been mates a long, long time, he said, but something's always puzzled me. He said, How is it that you chickens can always get across the road? He said, us hedgehogs, halfway, that's it, end of story. And the chicken said, well, it's quite straightforward, really. He said, are you sure? Just show me, he said, the hedgehog, just, I need to know. He said, my life's at stake here. Okay, he said, the chicken, he said, chicken get, gets the edge of the road, he looks left, looks right, looks left again, nothing coming, Cross the road, turned round, that was it, he said, that, it's that easy. Hmm. Hmm, said the hedgehog, he said, I think I've got the idea, he said, but can you show me again? Just don't want to get this wrong. <sighs> okay, says the chicken, so back he trots, he goes, left, he said, right, left again, anything coming? Nothing, crossing the road. Anyway, halfway across, round this corner, great big lorry comes belting around, doesn't see the chicken, chicken no chance, chicken then gets hit by the big lorry, splat. Well, the little hedgehog's distraught, absolutely destroyed. He goes rushing across and he, he looks at it and he, and he scrapes off his mate, the chicken. Ah, oh, he looks like more like a rolled up tea towel, he says. Anyway, it's a chicken. He says, what can I do? What can I do? He says, I know, he said, I'll take him to the vet. I know a good vet, he said. His name's Joe. Joe, he specialises in chickens. That's for real. He does. So if he can't do it, nobody can do it. Hmm. Well, Joe has a little puzzled look. He, he, he's good at puzzled looks, this Joe. He looks puzzled and he scratches his head and he's... Um, hmm. You sure it's a chicken, he said. He said, it's a chicken. He said, it's been best mate, mates for years, he said. Been best mates. Hmm. Uh, I, there's nothing I can do, he said. And the hedgehog, he said, anything. Just try and make him look a little bit like my mate, the hedgehog, when he was, when he was with me. And then I, I can sort of tell his family and he'd be... Well, I said, Joe, I'll have a little go. He said, he said hang on, he said. He said... Mm -hmm. uh, what? <laughs> it's not chicken, he said. He said, oh, no, yeah, okay, he says. Could he, just anything? He said, I don't know, he says. He said, what about, what about that? Does that look more like a chicken? No, he says, oh, no, he says, okay, well, Joe's poking and prodding and he's having another go. And he said, does that, the thing's going to be a last chat, he said, does that look like him? No, he said, not really. Okay, he said, Joe, last go. He said, let's just have a think, he said. I know. He said, does that look anything like him? Hmm. What do you think, said that joke? End of story. Bye. Happy Easter, everybody! Christ is risen. He has risen indeed. Hallelujah! Um, it's such a joy to be speaking to you on Easter Sunday, one of the best days of the year as far as I'm concerned and um, because the resurrection of Jesus Christ which just means him coming back 
to life from the dead, just means it's obviously quite a big deal, um, is everything to Christians um, and to what we call Christianity. If our Gospels, if our New Testaments finished at the cross, then possibly we would still have a religion called Christianity um, in the world today. But at best, it would offer some probably quite unattainable, good moral teaching um, and some examples of sacrifice and love. But it wouldn't offer anything different or better than the many other belief systems which are out there in the world today. Now, that might sound like quite a bold claim, but uh, I'm going to read Paul to back me up. So <laughs> he is writing a letter to some of the very first Christians um, in a place called Corinth. And there's an idea going around there amongst them that the resurrection of the dead, so people coming back again after they've died, um, isn't a thing. It's not going to happen or it isn't true. And Paul has some pretty strong words for them to put them right. Um, I'm going to read it from the International Children's Bible. It's in 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ was not raised, then our preaching is worth nothing. And your faith is worth nothing. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is for nothing. You are still guilty of your sins. If our hope in Christ is for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone else in the world. Okay, so I think, hopefully, Paul's got my back there, um, that the resurrection is completely central to our faith. And we can't separate the cross and the resurrection. Um, and we, I guess we do sometimes a little bit artificially, like this morning, we're going to talk more about the resurrection than the cross, um, and we do vice versa. But really, they're, they're part of the same act of God, and um, they're two different parts of it, and they're inseparable in terms of what they mean together in their wholeness. And when we have a story that we're very familiar with, um, it is easy to forget just how surprising the resurrection was and is for us today. And this morning, just briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the surprising nature of it, the unexpected nature of it for the first followers of Jesus. And then I think the continuing unexpected and surprising nature of it for us as followers of Jesus today. Can you just come and sign this for me? Yeah. Okay. So, thank you. Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene stood crying outside the tomb. She was still weeping when she stooped down and saw two angels inside. They were dressed in white and were sitting where Jesus' body had been. One was at the head and the other was at the foot. The angels asked Mary, why are you crying? She answered, they have taken away my Lord's body. I don't know where they have put him. As soon as Mary said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know who he was. Jesus asked her, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener and said, Sir, if you have taken his body away, please tell me 
so I can go and get him. Then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him, Rabboni. The Aramaic word Rabboni means teacher. Jesus told her, Don't hold on to me. I have not yet gone to the Father. But tell my disciples that I am going to the one who is my Father and my God, as well as your Father and your God. Mary Magdalene then went and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. She also told them what he had said to her. Dear Mary, there is nothing in this that is expected, Mary. It completely flies in the face of millennia of human heartbreak. In fact, this is so unexpected, Mary, that you are completely unprepared to receive it. Looking hard in the wrong direction and braced against the next wave of sorrow. Bracing yourself is not a bad idea, because a power is at work here that is undeniably a wildly in motion, and it's not what you were expecting. It is going to blindside you with hope. It is going to assault you with joyful exuberance. It is going to spin you around and propel you forward at speed on the, the breath of a victory shout. There is nothing in this that makes sense, Mary. It's completely upside, upside down, down and inside down. out. Joy, Joy arriving in the midst of despair. Peace arriving as your heart is at war. Life arriving as you stare into the open mouth of death. But he was always giving you clues, Mary. A kingdom that wasn't expected. A kingdom that doesn't make sense. The first are last. The meek take the earth. The children set the example. While the rich get stuck in a needle's eye. Enemies are cared for. Sinners are searched for holy men are called hypocrites, while women are chosen, chosen to, to witness. witness. This morning the woman is you, Mary. Why are you? While well, this is just a guess, but while some betrayed, fled, denied, locked the doors and hid with their sorrow, you, broken-hearted, you just followed. You, Mary, who he ransomed from hell, you followed him. Present as, as his, his kingdom, kingdom came, came, you who followed him to the cross. Present mm -hmm. at his death, you who followed his body to the tomb. Present, present at, at his, his burial. burial, and it is you still following him this morning present at his, his anointing. anointing. Ready to interact with your confusion, disillusion, following him still into the darkness and, and despair. despair. I think he recognised some of it himself in you, Mary, which makes it funnier that you didn't recognise him. There is a quality to your following that he must have loved dearly. There is an unwavering, unwavering obedience and devotion, devotion, a heart that followed, that kept you in motion, a loving obedience that endured change of season. And perhaps, perhaps, this, this was, was the reason, reason that, that he chose you for this moment, Mary. 
because you hadn't stopped following. You pursued through disappointment and sorrow, followed beyond where you thought he would lead. And when you have nothing left but stubborn love in your chest and feet that could choose nothing, nothing more and, and nothing, nothing less, less than following, you would find what all his followers do. Mary, he, he will, will always, always be the one always be the one to find you. So still your mind and listen. I think you will hear someone saying your name. Mary. Hi. Okay, well, a long time ago, I was um, hitchhiking around South Africa with a friend and um, we'd had a lift with this man and he picked us up in his van and um, we were going down, down the road near the coast and um, he said, where are you staying for the night? Well, we didn't know where we were staying for the night. So he said he had a um, uh, like big shed uh, that we could stay in at the bottom of his garden. So rather foolishly, we went off to stay in the shed at the bottom of his garden. And um, a bit later in the evening, he came down and he asked us if we'd like to go um, down to the pub with him. Um, I said no, but my friend did. So she went and I found myself in this um, shed at the bottom of the garden, lying awake in the pitch dark, wondering what was going on. Anyway, I got so scared that I decided to go and um, knock on the door of the house where earlier on I'd seen that there was an, uh, that there was an old man in the, in the house. So I thought I'd go and knock on the door and just see if I could wait in the house until he came back. So I walked up the garden, I um, knocked on the door and um, the door creaked open and there facing me was the old man with a gun pointing straight at my face. I had a shock. Um, and I think what we can forget about a story that we get very familiar with, like a story we repeat every year, so the resurrection, and hopefully we talk about it more often than that, um, is we can forget how surprising that story is and how surprising it would have been for the people living through it and actually how surprising it can still be in our lives today. Now, not all of us react the same way to unexpected events or surprises. Um, and actually quite a lot of us probably tend to react a little bit negatively just from first instinct to something that we're not expecting and that's human really and that's probably a way of keeping us safe um but i was interested in how did the disciples and the followers of jesus react on that easter sunday morning so i had a look through the gospel accounts initially it surprised me but thinking more about it it surprised me less most of the words that i could find to do with how they reacted or how they felt were probably overwhelmingly negative so i'll quickly whiz through the words that i found um, in Matthew, afraid, very frightened, afraid, and doubted. In Mark, we had confused, shocked, alarmed, trembling, bewildered, and frightened. In Luke, we had puzzled, terrified, disbelief, and wondering. And in John, we had distress and anguish, weeping, needing answers and not understanding. Now, of course, there were a few positives in there that I could find, but I could only find three that really stood out to me. And there may be a few more, but um, it said in Matthew, he says that although the women were terrified, they were also filled with great joy. And it also describes how they worshipped Jesus. So worship's always a very positive response. Um, and in John, it also says that um, some of their disciples, when they saw the empty grave, they saw and believed, although actually they still didn't understand, it says as well. But far from making me feel critical about the early followers of Jesus or um, 
making me feel that this was somehow a bad thing. Actually, I found it massively relatable. Um, and it also just convinced me if I needed any more convincing that these are true stories because they're real people reacting in normal ways. Um, and it's not like some perfect version where everybody knows the outcome to begin with. And so it's been written, so they react how they should react, that it's wonderful news. Um, so it's, it feels very genuine to me. And it also encourages me because of the place that eventually these same people are going to get to over the next few hours, days, weeks, for some. Um, because the resurrection is going to completely transform the followers of Jesus's view of the cross and of that whole weekend. Um, and the more that they understand what the resurrection was, that it's true, that it's happened and what it means as Jesus reveals himself to them a number of times, teaches them, speaks with them, and just the reality of it sinks in, it, it goes on to colour the whole of the rest of the New Testament, um, the, the truth of that sinking in about the resurrection. And particularly, I just was thinking, how has it changed their view of the cross? So I think if we could get into their heads on Good Friday or Easter Saturday, or even very first thing on Easter Sunday, I think if we asked them or could see what they were thinking about the cross and those events, I think the first thing that we would see is that there was just massive trauma, um, because it was a hugely traumatic thing that they'd been through, um, and we can see evidence of, of traumatic reactions in them. Um, I think they would be thinking there'd been some kind of mistake that there was a failure of some kind, maybe thinking of their own failure or God's failure even, um, that been a loss, a huge loss, a defeat, that there were probably too many broken promises and dreams for them to even start processing, and just a huge amount of confusion and pain. However, if we fast forward a few days, or for some, a, a bit longer than that, as it takes them to to believe and to understand what's really happened. Their perspective on the cross, and we can see this from what, what happens in the rest of the New Testament and what's written there, is completely transformed by the resurrection. So where it was mostly about trauma, they come to see a positive purpose in that for them and in through it for the world. Where they were maybe seeing a mistake, they come to see there's a divine plan at work. Where it felt like a failure, they can see that it's the success of this divine plan has happened, has, it, it, it's been a success. Um, where they were feeling just loss, they are actually seeing now that they were being given a gift, the greatest gift. Where it felt like a defeat, it's now the victory of Jesus over sin and death. Where they could see broken promises and broken dreams, now they're able to see prophecies fulfilled and um, the dreams of God coming into the hearts of men. And where there was confusion um, and pain, now there is clarity and peace and joy increasingly. Um, so, I mean, that's amazing. That is surprising, isn't it? That the cross, the same event, the event hadn't changed, the cross hadn't changed what had happened, but their perspective on it completely changed um, when they experienced and believed and understood the resurrection. So that was surprising for them in many ways. Um, for us today then, I think it is still God's power to bring us from a place of death to a place of life. I heard someone describing um, people becoming a Christian as an aftershock of the resurrection of Jesus. And actually, this is a lovely description because in, in baptism, that's exactly what is described, that we go down into the water, we're going down with Jesus, we're dying with Jesus, under the water, we're in the grave with him, and then we come out of the water and we're resurrected with him, we're raised to a new life. So that's on a spiritual level, and um, we experience the resurrection's power when we become Christians. Um, but, and of course, that points us towards the ultimate physical resurrection, um, which is also true um, and going to be true. And that's that was proved by Jesus's physical resurrection. Um, and also for us today, I think it gives us immense, uh, an immense source of courage because we can see how God worked with the human reactions of those early followers um, 
and he gave them the time. Jesus didn't just appear once and that was it. If they didn't believe that was it, he, he appeared to them in many different times and in many different places over a period of time. And he talked to them and he explained to them and um, he gave them the proof that they needed that this was a real thing. And, um, and ultimately that, that was able to, alongside the power of God coming in the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, that was able to totally transform their perspective on um, on the cross and on all that they'd been through. So that gives me courage because it says to me that when I react in um, a negative way to things that are unexpected or a shock in my life, that God is not um, disappointed with me, he's not telling me off, but actually he's just waiting to work with me and to take me on a journey of transformation if I will let him through the power of the resurrection of Jesus. He's the same God, so he hasn't changed. Um, so kind of really to sum all of that up, um, I think uh, that the surprise of the resurrection um, in our lives is to change our perspective on um, not just the cross, but on the things in our lives which are traumatic, which are painful, um, the trials we all go through in different ways. Um, so I think the resurrection has the potential, if we're able to let it, to change our experiences of trauma into an ability to see a positive purpose coming out of that, to, to view mistakes as being woven into a divine plan, and um, failures to actually see the success of that divine plan in our lives, in redeeming us, to go from a place of loss to receiving the gifts that God has for us, um, a place of defeat to knowing the victory of Jesus in our lives, a place where we perhaps have feel broken promises, broken dreams, to actually seeing prophecies fulfilled and the dreams of God coming true in our hearts. And from place of confusion and pain to a place where we are experiencing more clarity and peace and joy. Um, so in summary, the resurrection didn't cancel out the pain of the cross, and that's certainly not what I'm trying to say it did. But instead, it transformed the outcome of that pain um, into something surprisingly amazing and wonderful. And I think in the same way, that the, the surprise of the resurrection for us today is that it doesn't cancel out the pain and suffering we go through, but amazingly, unexpectedly, surprisingly, it can actually transform the outcome of that pain and suffering into something really, really beautiful. Happy Easter! <laughs>um, but also we know there's mink down there as well. So we um, set up the camera trap down by the river and um, we were really hopeful that we'd be able to see some great wildlife um, on the camera trap. And um, that wasn't quite what I found when we went to uh, recover the footage. So it was a bit of a surprise when we discovered this.
Well, I'm home. Yeah. I got you a little fuzzy. Oh, hi. 